feminist, but recently, when we did an episode where we interviewed former Prime Minister of Australia, Julia Gillard, and it was a genuine career highlight, mm. the thing that has made me the most excited since that's been available to listen to is the number of people who've sent me messages about pegs. Oh. Cal said in this show that she was looking for the perfect peg. Yeah, my side quest. Like, feminism is the main one, and then there's a side quest of pegs. Yeah. Just have to find the perfect peg. And what I said is to that, no, no. Pegs cannot be on your agenda at all. You're a feminist. Why do you care about holding washing on a line? And it's not okay. And I said that to her quite clearly. Very clearly, but I've been getting lots of lovely pictures of pegs. Well... Do you know what? Do you know what? I don't think Julia Gillard helped because she said she also was interested in finding the perfect head. She did! The two of them bonded over the top of me. I fought it, gang. I fought it. I tried my best to dissuade them to no avail. Now, the reason I don't give a fuck about pegs (laughs) is we can't hang washing outside in the UK. (laughs) It would just be, oh, what will I do? Will I peg this outside so that it can be torrentially rained on for the rest of its life? Or, actually, it's not even torrential rain. Here you get torrential rain. There you just get drizzle, mild drizzle. In Britain, it never rains. It just looks as if it's going to or it just has rained. But it's never rained. It's just like, ooh, a bit of, ooh. It's a damp lover. I feel like Brexit would have had a whole different outcome if the slogan had been, Britain is a damp lover. Well, certainly Europe would have been keener to get rid of us. Yes. As it was, they held on like we were a handbag in a crowded marketplace and to no avail because we have set ourselves, we've cast ourselves adrift, captained by Boris fucking Johnson. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Okay, well, let's talk about this. Jacinda Ardern. <laughs> would, you, would you be willing to go into an open relationship with Jacinda Ardern? and share her with the world. What I'm suggesting is Jacinda Ardern runs the world. Jacinda Ardern, (laughs) queen of the world. Thank you, I thank you, I thank you. I mean, it used to be that I had the twin hopes of Jacinda Ardern and Justin Trudeau. Justin Trudeau, oh, I have fallen out of love with him. Justin Trudeau, Justin Trudeau. I'm a feminist, but today I'm in Christchurch. I realised it was very late because I'd flown in from Australia, and so I woke up at like one o'clock because we didn't get in until one o'clock in the morning, and then we couldn't sleep too late because of the three-hour time change. So for me, it was like nine o'clock in the morning. And my producer, Jeff, who's a man, knocked on my bedroom door and said, I've got some things to tell you, admin, blah, blah, blah. And then as we were chatting, he said, quite surprised not to see you at the abortion rally today that was happening in Christchurch. And I was like, what? And I remembered that some people had tweeted me about it, and I thought, oh, I must look into that when I wake up. And I'd, in fact, missed it. It was going from 12.30 to 1.30, and I was still in bed. And he went, yeah, I went down to the abortion rally. He said, I took a walk, I saw it, I went over engaged, I protested. I was there protesting abortion in Christchurch, and yet you, a feminist in town for one day, and the one day when there was an abortion rally, were lying in bed. You were lying in bed while I, a man, was out protesting with my fellow feminists. Yes, I'm a feminist, I produce a feminist show. Why are you so surprised? And I said, don't tell them. I'm a feminist, but a few episodes ago, when I accidentally coined the phrase, fuck boyo. Yes. And then came back on the podcast with a t-shirt, which I had made with the words, fuck boyo, on the front. After I had gone to Spotlight and purchased the individual letters (laughs) and deliberately put them on the counter in the wrong order so the elderly lady wouldn't see that I was spelling fuck boyo... Someone made me this wonderful T-shirt with Fuck Boyo and Buck Yofo on it. Thank you very much, Alex. And my main concern is that you'll judge me because it's not ironed. It looks very... 
They've got one for you as well. Oh, that's amazing. That's so lovely. I will sleep in it tonight. <laughs> and nothing else. <laughs> I'm a feminist, but today... When I was trying to let Grace Petrie into the apartment that we're renting across the road from the theatre, and I was running around the flat looking for the intercom, there was no way of pressing her in. And the flat, it's a perfectly nice flat, but it doesn't have basic things like a bin, like there's no kitchen bin. And I was so angry when she came up, I called our apartment a basic bitch. <laughs> Are you sure you're supposed to be in there? Like, if there's no buzzer and there's no bin or furniture, like... <laughs> Well, just in a night. shipping container. Basically, last night we came in and we went into the wrong... There are two buildings that are both 115 and we went into the wrong building. What do you mean there's two buildings that are both 115? I know, I know. There's an east wing and a west wing. We didn't know. I, didn't, I wasn't expecting to be staying in Dalton fucking Abbey. <laughs> and it's just these kind of quest apartments across the road. Yeah, we ended up in the wrong floor. It was like The Shining. I saw a, some twin girls appear. It was awful. <laughs> One o'clock in the morning we got in and we're wandering around like headless chickens... Do you think it's called Quest because you have to go on a quest? Oh, maybe. <laughs> maybe. They oh, issue you with a horse that. and a lance and then it's up to you. Maybe, maybe. Anyway. I'm a feminist, but when a dude does something slightly feministy and people go, oh, well, you don't get a cookie for it, I sometimes think maybe he could have a cookie. Oh. <laughs> because my reasoning is this. Yeah. Uh, when we toilet trained my son... He had a sticker chart, and every five times that he managed to go in the toilet, he got a Thomas the Tank Engine train. Mm. He is 10 now. He no longer gets trains. But just for a start, he got a train. I'm a feminist, but backstage, Grace Petrie, just before we came out, I overheard her saying to someone else in the dressing room, I hate Jacinda Ardern. And I was like, don't open with that. And she said, no, I ate Jacinda Ardern. <laughs> Because someone kindly gave us some cupcakes with various faces of New Zealand feminists on, and she had eaten, eaten Jacinda Ardern. What she had not done was hated, hated Jacinda Ardern. So do not hate her when she comes out. She particularly ate Jacinda Ardern because she loves her so much. All right, I've got one more. Go on. I'm a feminist, but on the way to the theatre tonight, a woman stopped us and said, I'm a feminist, oh, yeah. but I'm afraid I'm going to see Jonathan Van Ness tonight. <laughs> and I have to say, I was quite tempted myself. Live from the Isaac Theatre Royal, Christchurch, New Zealand, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Carl Wilson, and our very special guests, Fiona Given and Hannah Hudson, talking about change. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White, this is Cal Wilson, and today we're talking about change. I mean, the whole of feminism is a push for change, isn't it? It's a movement for change. Mm. That's why feminists sometimes seem angry, because it's true, though, because fighting for change is always harder than fighting for the status quo. So the power structures are fighting for things to generally stay the same, and you always seem angry if you're fighting for change. Because if you're sitting at a table with friends for brunch and you go, I just don't really like this, can we go somewhere else? And they go, we're happy here. You're the one that has to do all the moving. So you're the one that seems a bit unhinged. Yeah, well, if you're moving everything, like you're taking the table and the plates and stuff like that, <laughs> tricky. Yeah, but that's what feminism needs to do. We need to take the table that belongs to the patriarchy. We need to take the plates... And frankly, the brunch food that the power structures have provided, and we need to move it somewhere else and reassemble it. In a restaurant of one's own. That's right, yeah. I think that's the case. Hmm. Um, what I'm having trouble with is that every time you say fighting for change, I'm thinking of uh, coins, and it's not that sort of change. No. no, I mean, we're fighting to make a change. Hmm. How do you feel about in your personal life? Do you feel you've changed in the last 10 years? Yes. As a feminist, as a person, yeah, as a woman. Do you know what? It was listening to the guilty feminist that I think started me changing. Really? Yes. 
And I don't even have to say that because I've already got the gig. But that's... <laughs> genuinely. Like, it was when I started listening to The Guilty Feminist, I felt like I'd woken up again and gone, oh, that's right, I used to be pissed off about stuff. That's so interesting. Well, thank you, that makes me very happy. But also, sorry I've made you so pissed off. <laughs> oh, don't apologise to me. Apologise to my husband. <laughs> It is true, though, you are happier when you don't know what there is to be yeah. angry about. But also, the more I know about, the more injustices I see. And sometimes I have to, like, turn Twitter off and go, I can't see another terrible thing or read about another terrible thing because I don't have the energy or the focus anymore to get angry about another thing mm -hmm. and to get engaged with another thing. I'll have to save that horrible other thing for another day. I was asked one of those, you know, they do those sort of ten questions if you're a comedian. In a magazine. Right, right, right. Sorry, this is not just a random person coming up on the street. This was a magazine article. And they ask you ten philosophical questions. And they asked me, what did I fear the most? And I realised, because I was writing them really quickly, I realised what I feared the most was contentment. Oh, I see, I would have gone with spiders. <laughs> it was a philosophical question, though. Still spiders. <laughs> I live in Australia now. Here's my, this is my joke about huntsman spiders mm. that I wrote uh, for New Zealanders. What do you call a huntsman spider with four legs? A coffee table. Wow. But you go with contentment, that's fine. No, no I genuinely fear contentment. And what I realised when I was writing the answers, like non-censoring the answers to these questions, was that what I wanted more than anything at the end of my life was contentment. But I only wanted to experience it for the last hour. And that's because wow. I think content people don't make anything or change anything. If you're content, you're happy with things how they are. And I'm so frightened of getting content because then I won't make or change anything. I'll just sit there and consume what other people have made. But at the, right at the end, on my deathbed, I'd like to go, I've done enough. I feel content. But wow. literally no longer than 90 minutes. Is anyone else feeling worried about how happy they are in their personal lives? I'm... <laughs> I think you could be happy and not content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, the things that make me happiest is when I'm purposefully trying to change the things I'm discontent about. That's what makes me happy. Unfortunately, I spend most of the time that I could be doing that on Instagram. <laughs> That's, sadly, that is the case. But I try and balance it out and do a thing, then look at Instagram, do a thing, then look at Instagram, do a thing, then look at Instagram. Is anyone else severely addicted to their phone? Yes. I'm just concerned about it. I feel if it had just happened to one of us, there'd have been an intervention. But it's happened to all of us at the same time, so there's no one to intervene. No, because we're all at the intervention, just taking selfies of ourselves. Yeah. And making Instagram stories of the intervention. I can't work out Instagram stories. I can't. Anyway, I'll this is it. not for you, but we can talk about it afterwards. Yeah, no, I'll do, I'll do a tutorial with you in the bar, and I'll ruin your life with it. It always um, goes like this when we're together. and We always get off topic. We're going to be doing this when we're 85 in our bath chairs at our retired feminist's home. Home for retired feminists? Yes, yeah. but it would be the grumpy feminist by then. I would love that to be the end of my days, to just sit and bitch with a lot of old feminists. <laughs> just bitch about the patriarchy. No, nah, but you but see, what, what you'd be doing is yeah. you'd be bitching about the patriarchy and we'd be going, <laughs> remember when there used to be one? Yes, yes. That's... I can't prove it, Carl, but that's what I was just thinking. Should we talk about these uh, beautiful cupcakes? Yes, let's talk about these beautiful cupcakes. We got given beautiful, or you got given, I'm just claiming it because I ate some of them. Uh, we got some beautiful cupcakes from Kate, who, uh, Kate McDonald, thank you so much, Kate. Uh, and she put um, favourite feminists on them. So we've got uh, Kate Shepherd from the $10 note. We've got I'm a Feminist But and Smash the Patriarchy. We've got Helen Clark, and there used to be Jacinda Ardern, but we ate her. We ate her. We ate her. <laughs> there were quite a lot of Jacinda Ardern's in there. To be honest, it they was went a box. First. It was like a dozen. There's four left. <laughs> There's more people than us in the dressing room, but at this point of the tour, if you're offered sugar, you do not look at gift horse in the mouth, even if that gift horse has Jacinda Ardern's face. Uh, so thank you, Kate. Thank you very much. That's so kind of you. Are you in? Or did you just drop the cakes and run? Thank Hello, you, Kate. Kate. Are, you, are, you a, are you a professional baker? No. Oh, how did you do it so well then? Because <laughs> they're perfect. Oh, that's so lovely. Thank you so much. I'm amazed. And I don't want to be my mother and say, you could do that for a living. Which is what, does, that, does your mom ever you, do that? Are you telling a feminist she should cook? Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm going, have you ever thought of opening a cupcake shop like you're in a romantic comedy and that's the only job open to women? <laughs> <laughs> and that's all you aspire to. That's always the... It is, it's always Rom-coms. a cupcake shop. I'll tell you what it is. It's a woman who's good at making cupcakes but doesn't have the confidence to open her own cupcake shop. And then some douchebag loser, Seth Rogeny type, comes along, he is a terrible boyfriend in every other way except he believes in the dream of her cupcake shop. <laughs> And he tells her she can do it. And because he tells her she can do it, she suddenly believes. And this is the fiction gap for me. This Mm -hmm. is where I can't get to. If the worst man in the world, himself a man-child who sleeps with a bong, who can't get up in the morning, believes I can do something, to me, that just casts a shadow of doubt over the whole thing. Mm. Because he's not right about anything else. Sorry, I've got stuck on him sleeping with a bong. Like, he got it when he was a baby. And it's like his, <laughs> his favourite cuddly bong. And he's like, oh, no, Mr. Bong. We have to have Mr. Bong. We can't sleep without Mr. Bong. <laughs> That's very much how it's played. Yeah, don't you remember that? In yes, Knocked no, Up. It's always a cupcake shop. Because I suppose you want to see that she's a businesswoman, but you also want to know she goes in a kitchen. Mm. Well, also, it's sort of visceral. It's, sort of, it's pretty colours for a movie. But, you know, like, even Diane Keaton in It's Complicated or whatever that one was... The, it's quite a, not long ago. Di, it's Diane Keaton doing one of those grown-up rom-coms, you know, where she's, she finds an actor who's not working much anymore. What, in, as a character, or is that the actor that's got the part in the movie? Yeah, the actor of the parts. It's like an actor, we go, I remember him. You know what I mean? Oh, yes, he was like, in that thing. Yes. Or like Robert De Niro hasn't worked for ages, and then someone says, do you want to do a rom-com with Diane Keaton? And he's like, oh, all right. Exactly. Even in those it's cupcakes. Always a cupcake shop. Yeah. Anyway, Kate, don't open a cupcake shop. You're better than that. (laughs) Um, It's quite a roundabout way of saying that, but we got there. But please, every time we're in town, make cupcakes for us. I feel now like I'm a 1975 male comedian who's come into town in a frilly shirt saying, make me cupcakes, love. Sorry, (laughs) sorry, Kate. Only if you want to. Are you ready for some stand-up comedy? Yeah. Then please welcome to the stage the incredible Carl Wilson. Yeah. So I've been contemplating the change of life recently uh, because that seems to be what people call menopause. And I don't like the word menopause because I feel like if you say it too much, it summons it. It's a bit like... Bloody Mary, if you say Bloody Mary enough, Bloody Mary turns up. But if you say menopause enough, you never see Bloody Mary again. I think that's <laughs> what happens. I'm aware that I'm a middle-aged woman, and I know that's not a shock to you because you're looking at me, but I am still coming to terms with it, and I'm still so bemused by the changes that are taking place. Like, my body has started to fall apart. Like, I don't mean in big ways. I don't mean, like, oh, prolapse or anything like that. Um, <laughs> although I do always wear leggings, just in case. But... <laughs> Just little things have started to fall up. Like my eyes have started to spontaneously water for no reason several times a day. Just I'll be perfectly happy walking along and suddenly I've got tears rolling down my face. Like I was sitting at breakfast the other day and my husband looked at me and I appeared to be weeping. And he said, what's wrong with you? And I had to pretend to be sad about something. I was like, um, I was just thinking about Bambi's mother. You know, she was such an important part of that story, but she never got her own first name. She was always just Bambi's mother. Like, they didn't even call her Mrs. Venison or anything. <laughs> Another thing that's telling me that I'm getting older is that I am simultaneously giving less of a shit about big stuff and getting really incredibly furious over things that don't matter. <laughs> I don't know if that's happened to anyone else, but I just find myself so angry at tiny things now. Um, for example... Um, The bottom of a down escalator is not the place to plan, is it? It's not the place to plan. That's not the place to plan. If you had all that time on the way down to go, oh, I wonder where cotton on is, you don't get to the bottom and stand there, keep fucking moving! Oh, walk for 10 metres, stand behind a bin, sort your life out. Oh, so here's here's another one. This also annoys me on escalators. It annoys me when people don't stand to one side. You stand to one side so people like me who want to angrily tromp down the escalator can get past you. But I have a strategy now. If there are two people standing next to each other on the escalator, I stand behind the one that shouldn't be standing there and very close to the back of their neck, I go, excuse me. (laughs) And then when they move, I don't. (laughs) 
another thing um, that bothers me, here's another one. If you are 19 and you work in retail, my name is not Babes. It's not Babes. I could have given birth to you if I'd been more organised. It's not Babes. The one that really gets me, though, is shorts should not be shorter than their own pockets. <laughs> then it looks like your shorts have had the prolapse, doesn't it? Blah, blah. It's terrible. I get so angry at things. I get so angry at things. And the other thing that is changing about me is that now my inside thoughts have become outside thoughts. <laughs> like, it's like my inside thoughts have been playing happily in a garden for years. And then one of them's found a hole in the hedge and now they're out in the street going, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. It's terrible. Like, I like to think that I'm a nice person, but the other day I walked out of the Melbourne Town Hall into a Hare Krishna parade and out loud I went, oh, well, this is fucked. <laughs> like, that is not fair. Like, they don't deserve that. Like, they are quite literally not hurting a fly. Like, I'm pretty sure that's one of their things. And, like, I've always liked to compliment strangers. Like, if I see you walking along the street and you look amazing, I'm always going to tell you because I think you can really make someone's day. And so I've always been like, oh, I love your top. Those are great shoes. Now, not always a compliment. <laughs> Sometimes like, oh, I love that top. That's a great skirt. You could lift your game. Like, just terrible. <laughs> I, just, I, I just get so angry at stuff over nothing. I find myself muttering out loud. And the thing I find myself muttering out loud most often is, oh, do your job. It's terrible. Like I was in a supermarket the other day. I'd gone into a supermarket and it was one of those little organic supermarkets where everything's uh, packaged in cardboard and it tastes like shit, but it was made in Byron, so it's so expensive. And so I go into the supermarket and I need to find two packets of corn chips for a party. I find the corn chips. They're on sale, so they're only reasonably overpriced. I take them up to the counter. The woman scans them and they ring up at full price. And I go, oh, sorry, they were on sale. And she goes, ah. Oh. I've put them through now. And I was like, yeah, but it's not like they've gone through customs, is it? It's not like they haven't gone through international departures. Like, they're still there. Like, I could touch them if I wanted to. And I look at her and go, but they were on sale. And she goes, mm, I'd have to call for the manager. And I was like, you would. And she hasn't gone through customs either. Like, she's right there. I could touch her if I wanted to. And I just looked at it. And eventually she goes, I suppose I should do my job. Yeah! Do your job! And then she made such a fuss over fixing her fuck up that I overthanked her for being barely adequate. I was so. I have a lot of supermarket based rage, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, I have a lot of supermarket based rage. The ones that really aggravate me in a supermarket are the people who are surprised they have to pay. I don't know if you've encountered them, but they're always in front of me at the checkout. You know, the people that put their stuff up on the counter and then they go offline, they're just standing there like, boo! And eventually the checkout operator goes, oh, that's $60.70. And then they go, oh, better get my wallet. Have your wallet out! Oh, my God. Just have your wallet. Keep the flow going. Oh, man. <laughs> Entirely coincidentally, I used to work in a supermarket. Uh, <laughs> It wasn't the worst job I had. My first job ever was um, shelving books in Bishopdale Library. And when I say shelving books, I mean putting books on a shelf, not whoop. Um, <laughs> you, you only make that mistake once. So... Uh, <laughs> I worked at Bishop Dale Library two hours a week. My pay was $1.24 an hour. And by the end of the year, I'd saved up enough to buy a pair of blue corduroy stirrup pants. And in hindsight, I wish they'd paid me less. But what I, what I learned, what I learned from uh, working in the supermarket was that people wish you to be friendly and efficient, but they don't want you to have a personality. And I learned this one day when a woman came through my checkout and she had squashed her bread in the trolley. It was quite squashed, and so she was beating it quite vigorously with her hand, trying to get it into shape, and so she's hitting it quite hard. And so I just leaned over and went, bad bread. <laughs> Naughty bread. And she just looked at me and went, oh, use the other aisle. But I also found I could get myself into conversational trouble with people that I knew. Like, one day this man came through my checkout. His name was Mr. Mason, and he was a, a lovely old man that had worked with my mum. So, and, and what I knew about Mr. Mason was that he was lovely and that he had a dear old beagle called Sam. So when Mr. Mason turns up in my checkout, I know exactly the conversation we're going to have. So he gets up to me and I go, hello, Mr. Mason, how's Sam? And he goes, dead. <laughs> and I went, oh, my God, no, when? And he goes, Today. He was literally on the way home from the vet having put his beloved companion down. And I don't know if you can work this out without my help, but there is no coming back from that. <laughs> there is no coming back from dead today. Nothing. That is the end of the conversation. Dead today. Nothing. Nothing. 
no more talking. I have learned that lesson so profoundly that to this day, if someone asks after my husband, <laughs> and I can't really be bothered talking to them, <laughs> sometimes I just say that. <laughs> How's Chris dead? I don't, I don't. I don't. I mean, I would love to, but I feel like it will be tempting fate. Because uh, I feel like it will be true one day. I think he will die before me because I think he'll be like, oh, she's still going, Blah. just die out of self-defence. That's, that's what's going to happen. Um, the, the, the final thing that, that tells me I'm getting older, though, is my son. My son is always telling me that I'm getting older and things are changing. For my birthday, I turned 49 in October, and for my birthday, he gave me a card that he had chosen himself. And it was a beautiful, big card. It had a lovely embossed 50 on the front. Big, beautiful, gold embossed 50, and above it he had written, almost. <laughs> and when I opened the card, it had some beautiful sentiment about how isn't it wonderful that you've lived this long, because that's meant we've had so much wonderful time together. And he had written, I hope this next year goes really slowly. <laughs> because, wow, half a century. <laughs> that's old. <laughs> Thank you. Kyle Wilson, everybody! Hello, Guilty Feminists. This is Deborah. We're all stuck inside, but we're doing what we can to bring you as much Guilty Feminist goodness as possible. I'm also doing another series of Skills Booster webinars. We got such great feedback from these at the end of last year, but some people said the afternoon time wasn't great for them. So I'm doing the same three topics, but at 8.30 p.m. in the evening. So you could join me after you've got home from work or put the kids to bed or walk the dog. And if you watched last time, do feel free to watch again. The topics are the same, but I always think of new things to say and new ways to say them. And people always ask different questions. We're starting Wednesday, 17th of Feb with Include Yourself and Include Others. And you can get tickets by going to guiltyfeminist.com or by clicking the link in the show notes. Lastly, thank you so much to everyone who has signed up to support us on Patreon. We really couldn't keep the podcast going without your support. No exaggeration. We're doing regular monthly Zoom hangouts where you can ask me questions, hear what's going on in my life. And for the next one, Monday, 25th of January, we're doing a Burns Night poetry special with some surprise guests. It'll be feminist poetry, not Burns poetry. Let's be incredibly honest. So to be a part of that, and lots of jokes and lols and chat. So to be part of that, go now to patreon.com slash guilty feminist and sign up. We've also just released some warm-up material from the North American tour exclusive to Patreon, so there's lots of goodies waiting for you. I know the pandemic has hit a lot of people very hard, but if you're not already contributing and it's possible for you to show your support, then every penny really does count. And if you can't help us financially, why not spread the word? We love it when you listeners find the podcast, so if you could write about it, tweet about it, make an Instagram story with a little recording, or just tell someone you know about it, that would be a great help. Thanks to everyone who's listening to this. Guilty Feminist listeners are the best in the world. And we do love you all. And now back to the podcast. We have two guests tonight. Our first guest was the organizer of today's abortion law reform rally, right here in Christchurch, connected up with other rallies around New Zealand. Our other guest is a former world champion in future problem solving, the curator of TEDx Youth in Christchurch, and works for BOMA New Zealand, delivering transformational learning experiences for a smart, ethical future. Put your hands together and make incredible Christchurch welcoming guilty feminist woohooing noises for Fiona Given and Hannah Hudson. <laughs> Come take a seat and a microphone. Hi, I'm Fiona Given. So I'm from the National Council of Women and I was one of the organizers of the abortion law reform rally. Wonderful. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hannah Hudson and um, among other things, I'm the curator of TEDx Youth at Christchurch. Wonderful. So, Hannah, let's talk to you first, because you are 19, is that right? I'm 20. 20. Yeah. But you were 19. <laughs> yes. Yes. At, I mean, at one point, many of us were 19 as well. Uh, it's just one of the ages you can be. But what we, have, what we have noticed about your generation is you really are smashing it. 
Gen Z is giving us all hope. I think this is because you're autodidacts, you're the first generation of autodidacts, which means you could teach yourself from the internet. Because when I was growing up, I could only learn from teachers, textbooks, and parents. They were the only sources I had. We did have a set of Funk and Wagnalls. They're encyclopedias, young people. Oh, okay, great. I thought it was a yeah. musical instrument. <laughs> no. Set of Funk and Wagnalls, and at school there was the Encyclopedia Britannica. And what was curated in that is what I had the option of learning. And that, of course, was curated in a very colonial way, in a very patriarchal way. And if you questioned things, you were told you were wrong. And you and your generation have had access to all the information in the world, all the viewpoints in the world, and so you've been able to go online and form opinions and understand what the facts are, and you've been able to educate your parents in many cases. What is it like being part of that generation, and how do you think so many of you are just getting up and doing stuff at an age where we would have just been behind a bike shed with a bottle of something that we'd stolen from our parents' liquor cabinet (laughs) and some Marlboro (laughs) menthols and working out how to snog. And listen, by the way, (laughs) if you have not got the internet, it's very difficult to work out how to pash. (laughs) You don't know, you don't know. I I think without trying to speak on behalf of all young people there... No, that's what I'm asking. Um, All of them ever. I specifically said, I'll speak for all young people. Yeah, great. Um, I think there, a lot of people feel two things. Um, One is anxiety around our kind of hyper-awareness of the future that is coming towards us. And I think that we also have the blessing of having a degree of naivety and hope that it can be different because we have a shorter period of frames of reference of our own life experience. Um, And so there is so many possibilities because our own lives have changed so much. And also... I think that lots of people feel that sense of urgency and just aren't afraid to get stuck in and try something because the cost of an action is too high now. And so so I think I feel like sometimes I get paralysed by fear. You know, like there's something I'm frightened of, I think I can't possibly do something about that. So how is it that so many young people... Uh, just not going, oh, shit, there's nothing we can do, and they're actually going, no, we've got to change it. What is different about it? I think that some young people are paralysed by fear because it is scary. Um, But I think, too, that it's important to cultivate a mindset of excellence rather than perfection because we better do something as best we can. As um, What an incredible turn of phrase. (laughs) Excellence rather than... stolen from Brene Brown. Um, but I love Brenna Brown. I did a gig with her once, and I wow. yeah, I made her take loads of selfies with me. And then she said she'd come on the podcast. And I never heard from her again. Maybe maybe I took <laughs> too many selfies. Happen. Yeah, that'd be really good. Well, you could come on again and tell her how much she's influenced you. But like even then, you're 20 years old, and Brenna Brown is you know middle aged, and you're you're so connected in to that. So excellence rather than perfection. Go on. What else can we learn from you, via Brenna? <laughs> oh, goodness Brené me. By you. Um, this is a cheeky plug because this is something we teach at Bowman New Zealand around courageous leadership. And one thing that I think is really important is that it's better to do what's right than what's fun, fast, or easy. Mm. Um, fun, fast, or easy? Yes. Which were three adjectives that described our teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> jokes! <laughs> jokes! <laughs> I was, oh, a Jehovah's, uh, I was a Jehovah's Witness, no one touched me or looked at me. But, but this is hard stuff, right? It's like, it's not stuff we get right all the time. And so you fall over and you have to learn to get back up and, and circle back and reconcile with people and keep moving forward. Yes, so much wisdom at such a young age is intimidating. But <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Could you tell us a little bit about future problem solving? Because I think this future problem solving is all about young people seeing the world as it is, seeing as they'd like it to be, and being the change in the middle. So, um, future problem solving is something that I started when I was 11 years old. And the basic... um, (laughs) The basic um, idea of it is that you get given a story that's set 15, 20 years in the future on a specific topic. So it could be something like energy or social isolation or climate change. Uh, water quality, anything, and students are taught how to solve problems from a strategic point of view. So it's not just about coming up with a solution to climate change, it's about really breaking down what the issue is, clearly defining the problem, and also defining what your criteria for success are. 
And so then with that set of skills, you can become really creative because no one knows what 2030 looks like. And so you can invent things, you can get creative and combine existing things in new ways. And that's how I learned to really engage with the world as it is and the world as it could be. Wow. And are you doing that through tech? One of the things that's really cool about future problem solving is there are 16 different points of view that we consider. And so when I say a point of view, it could be economics, it could be technology, it could be education. And so in a competitive situation, a team or individual will come up with 16 different solutions and they have to do that from each of the 16 different points of view because there are limits to what technology can do, but technology is a very powerful actor. And so it's important that students are encouraged to think about how technology interacts with economics, how it interacts with government, how it interacts with justice, and so therefore thinking about solutions that may also include technology and also include kind of a futuristic aspect, but is fundamentally grounded in a whole range of ways that our world is constructed. Wonderful. And is future problem solving only in Christchurch? Future problem solving is all around the world. Oh. Um, and, and you started it when you were 11? No, no, no. I did not start the program. I um, competed and participated in oh, the program. Oh, you participated in it, but yes. at 11? So it was started by a guy named E. Paul Torrance um, in Georgia, maybe back in around 1970. Um, and then has since been running in New Zealand for, I think, 25 years. And so there are thousands and thousands of students around the world that come together to discuss important global and did issues. Did you win it one year, Hannah? I have won the national champs several times. Several times? And the world champs once as well. What? (laughs) What was your world champion winning idea? Um, So the topic for the world champs was energy of the future. And what is important to understand is that because it's set in the future, they usually try and kind of create a bit of a curveball. And so there was some additional complexities in the scenario we were given and the... Um, scenario was set in the Galapagos Islands and so it was quite complex in terms of their environmental challenges and the solution that was existing in this scenario was based around biomimicry and so what I focused on doing was using what they were already doing with biomimicry but making it more in tune with the existing natural ecosystems. Um, Biomimicry, just for our global listeners, uh, some of them may not know, I obviously... (laughs) I am, I, I am one of those global listeners. I obviously do know a lot about biomimicry. Is it when you do impersonations of like <laughs> crickets and fish, that kind of thing? Absolutely. So, um, oh, it is. <laughs> to, to a certain extent. Not like, not like a bad comedian in vaudeville going, oh, so things like this one's a mouse. At, looking at the structure of a bird wing and using that to inspire how you engineer planes and um, oh. basically thinking nature's done this pretty well for millions or hundreds of millions of years and so thinking what can we Learn. remind ourselves of what's already out there. So your project, which I thought I was going to understand, but I don't, <laughs> is something to do with going, oh, birds are good. Can we copy birds, solve the world problems? Yes, Thank although you. it's worth mentioning that the type of future problem solving that I do is theoretical, and so I'm working, pretending it's 2030. So I didn't actually have to deliver any of the uh, proposed solutions. Mm. That would be no, a different ball but game. What an incredible thing for your generation to be doing is to be using your imagination, your creativity, because we're going to have to move very, very, very fast to fight the current uh, ecological problems, environmental problems. So what you're doing is absolutely incredible. And to have won, you're a Christchurch local girl? Absolutely, yep. And you won the world championships for future problem solving. So you should be very proud, Christchurch. <laughs> Can we ask you, Fiona, about the abortion law reform rally. Could you please explain why you need abortion reform here in New Zealand, where you can access abortion if you need one? Your Prime Minister is Jacinda Ardern. What could you possibly be rallying for? What are you trying to change? So abortion in New Zealand under current legislation is actually illegal. Under the current legislation, you have to talk to two different consultants um, who then can decide whether your decision to have an abortion will have an adverse effect on maternal health, and that does include mental health. And so most abortions in New Zealand are performed 
under that caveat um, that say that mental health to the mother will be adversely affected. It, which, to be fair, if you were asked to carry anything in your body for nine months <laughs> and then push it out of... So, well, push something the size of watermelon out of the hole or the size of a tampon, it would affect your mental health Absolutely. unless you were right bang on for it. And even then, even if you wanted the watermelon... It, still then it's probably going to, you know, but, but then you're not being forced to do it. So it will affect your mental health. That's absolutely valid. But you shouldn't have to go, oh, it's a mental health issue. You should just be able to say, I want to terminate. So you're looking to change the law. Yes. Yeah, so the law was last updated in 1977. And so... Jacinda Ardern was not Prime Minister then. <laughs> It has been through the first reading in the House and went to select committee and then has just been taken out of select committee and we'll have its second reading. Um, some of the stuff that came out of select committee was positive in that it will take abortion out of the Crimes Act. Some was decidedly negative in that, for example, one of the things that they have decided to put into the new legislation after passing through select committee was they put a specific caveat in for people to give conscientious objection to providing contraception, including the morning after pill, to uh, victims of sexual assault. That was something they specifically put in after select so committee. Sp specifically targeting victims of sexual assault? Yep. Why? That's, obviously it had come up in select committee and that seems to be one of the things at the moment... Sorry, can we just back up? So you can be a conscientious objector working in a chemist. Yep. You can say, I'm a Christian, I'm not giving you the morning after pill, and that's even if it was a sexual assault. Absolutely. That's so, the current legislation as well. Okay, so at the moment, if you're working in a chemist, you can refuse to serve someone? Yes. That's not right, that, is it? It's, yeah, that seems extraordinary. Yeah, that doesn't seem right at all. So with the legislation now, so that's in place, so you can conscientiously object yep. to someone getting the morning after pill. So if it passes through, is there a chance to fight that particular piece of legislation, or does it have to be all done? No, there, there will be further debate, and yep. to my knowledge at least, hopefully wow. that will be removed. So what can New Zealanders listening to this do to get behind your efforts? I know that there's... They there's can wake up in time for the rallies, Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> I got in a talk. I did, couldn't sleep till 4 a.m. It felt like really early in my time. I'm really sorry, I'm a bad feminist. <laughs> what can New Zealanders do? Because uh, I'm not, and I think we need to be clear about this, a New Zealander. So the biggest thing is talk to your MPs. Tell them how important it is, particularly about things like conscientious objection. Tell them how important it is to you. Write to them. I mean, Facebook them. They're generally fairly responsive, particularly if you're... You know, mm. of the same politics but um, that's probably the most important thing make it a news item talk to your friends about it see what kind of opposition there is basically make it a fundamental part of this election campaign because mm. they all want power their whole job is to get voted back in so if you say this is fundamental to me voting for you they do rattle the cage they have to because they have to risk they don't make laws for people who don't vote they don't legislate for people who don't speak up and so we have this incredible opportunity. New Zealand was the first country in the world where women could vote. Yeah. And I think you don't want to take that lightly. You want to carry that torch forward and make the world better for the next generation of women and people of minority genders who can fall pregnant when they do want to and when they don't want to. So go out and advocate for it. Is there anyone we should follow? Um, so ALRAN's Abortion Law Reform New Zealand is kind of spearheading this campaign and also FemForce was one of the main organisers for the rally. Okay, great, thank you. Hannah, how can young people get involved with what you're doing and how can everybody else who isn't Gen Z support what you're doing and support this next generation? TEDx Youth at Christchurch is not, does not have another event in the works at the moment, but um, you can still follow us on Instagram at TEDx Youth Christchurch. We 
are still a platform for young people to connect and um, we can advocate for other awesome things happening in um, the youth space. You can also go on YouTube and check out the videos of our talks from previous events. They have several hundred thousand views um, if you just search TEDx Youth at Christchurch on YouTube. And also shout out to our friends and mentors at TEDx Christchurch who have amazing, amazing talks that have millions and millions and millions of views. So I would really recommend that. I also think that for someone that is not Gen Z, the most important thing that you can do is connect with young people in your lives. Um, there is nothing more difficult than being in a situation where you hear phrases like, we think young people think. Um, assuming that we um, have a particular point of view is not helpful because we, like every other group, are not a monolithic group. Um, and so, um, yeah, I would just say engage with the young people in your life don't dismiss things that are led by young people um, because you've, we've seen it with School Strike for Climate. Um, there are so many examples of young people doing amazing things. I would just say engage, help them out, amplify, amplify, amplify. Wonderful. And now put your hands together for our closing act, the truly wonderful Lester legend, that is Smoke Screen, Smoke Show, Grace Petrie! <laughs> Hello, Grace Church! <laughs> Goodness me. Are you all right? Oh, it's my first time in New Zealand. And, uh, yeah, I'm having a great time. Uh, I suffer quite a lot from imposter syndrome. Um, give me a shout, Christchurch, if anybody here suffers from imposter syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> very self-aware in Christchurch, aren't we? Blimey. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, I'm very, very fortunate that this is what I get to do with my life. I am a professional musician, um, but I do feel on a daily basis quite unqualified um, for this job. But so I wrote a song um, all about imposter syndrome and... Uh, and about um, how often it can feel when you're, when you're trying to do what I think we're all trying to do, which is trying to sort of work to make the world a better place. Often you can sort of feel like you're a little bit unqualified for what you're talking about, but um, I've got a song that's gonna make you all feel better about it. <laughs> um, and it's called Nobody Knows That I'm a Fraud. <laughs> and it gets this. I don't watch PMQs as often as you might expect I only live tweet question time for comedic effect And I've never read Virginia Woolf or any Bert or Brecht And nobody knows that I'm a fraud It's often been alleged that I'm as hard left as can be But my idea of edgy is an unknown brand of tea and I'm not even veggie, let alone dairy-free Nobody knows that I'm a fraud But I'll get up underneath the lights until I feel adored And I'll never tell you anything I think you won't applaud Oh, it might not always be the truth, but it'll have three chords Nobody knows that I'm a fraud Nobody knows that I'm a fraud Well, dressing how I do, I find I often get mistook By graphic novel fans who judge me on the way I look But I just like Batman shirts, I've never read a comic book Nobody knows that I'm a fraud When people call me a musician, that makes my palms perspire I took grade one piano and I never got no higher if I didn't have this capo, then you'd all see I'm a liar. Nobody knows that I'm a fraud. But I'll get up underneath the lights until I feel adored. And I'll never tell you anything I think you won't applaud. Oh, it might not always be the truth, but it'll have three chords. Nobody knows that I'm a fraud. Nobody knows that I'm a fraud. 
And some days I get so scared that we're losing And some days I'm just so sure we'll never win And some days I get so knackered from refusing To let that in, to let that in Whoa Well, some days Life feels like a play that you have not rehearsed but one thing's true of all of us sharing this universe is we could all be doing better and we could all be doing worse and everyone you know feels like a fool come on and get up underneath the lights until you feel adored but never tell them anything you think they won't applaud oh it might not always be the truth but it'll have free chords nobody knows that i'm a fraud oh it might not always be the truth but it'll have free chords and i guess i'll take up spoken word when i run out of court because nobody knows that i'm a fraud You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Cal Wilson, and our very special guests, Hannah Hudson and Fiona Gibbon. Live music is from Grace Petrie. The Guilty Feminist theme song was by Mark Hodge and produced by Nick Sheldon. The producers were Tom Zelinsky for the Spontaneity Shop and Jeff Ring for Australian Comedy Management. Thanks to everyone at the Isaac Theatre Royal, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. when she comes on, the audience leave thinking they've had a better time than they've had. <laughs> <laughs> no, just music. It's, it's, it's witchcraft. Tall and tan and young and lovely, the girl from Ipanema. I've told you before, we're not booking you as the musician. I've said it, I've said it so many times. It wasn't a musical, you know. Yeah. <laughs> If you sing Old Man River, I am never talking to you again. No. Okay, I'm going to say you have been listening.